Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to Parish Art Museum Friday Nights Live. I'm Alicia Longwell. I'm the Lewis B. and Dorothy Coleman, Chief Curator here at the museum. And firstly, I'd like to thank our wonderful sponsors. First of all, our presenting sponsor, Bank of America, and also our generous friends, Sandy and Stephen Pearlbinder. Also, a, thank, a th big thank you to Art Bridges, who has supported our public programs and online presentations uh, since our reopening in August. So lovely to see you all out there tonight. And I wanna welcome, firstly, some joining me to talk about James Schuyler tonight is Nathan Kernan. By way of introduction, I will just say that Nathan um, has edited the diaries of uh, James Schuyler published in 1997 and is working on um, the autobiography of the poet to be published by Ferris Strauss and Giroux. I can't think of a more fabulous person to talk with about this extraordinary uh, poet. Good evening, Nathan. Good evening, Alicia. So nice to be here with you virtually. Good, good. good. Yes, it is virtual at this point, but uh, makes it easy to uh, this time of year avoid snowstorms and everything else. So we'll just come from one another's very warm uh, living rooms, I hope. Yes. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you here and talk about uh, Skylar. We have uh, had an exhibition of Fairfield Porter's work and also talked a lot about that extraordinary period of arts and letters in American uh, life from the second half of the 20th century. And, um, just a, a bit about uh, the New York School of Poets, sort of a, a loosely uh, categorized school, but one that included Schuyler, of course, John Ashbery, Kenneth Koch, Frank O'Hara, and Barbara Guest. Um, how would you characterize Schuyler in that group? Was he age-wise, <coughs> origin-wise? <laughs> he was a little... He was a little older than, um, than uh, Frank or John, and I guess a little older than Jane as well. Right, um, right. Actually, I think Barbara Guest was older still, but, right. but I'm not sure. But originally when he first uh, met them, he, he thought of them, they, he, he had already been uh, kind of around and he'd, he'd, he'd had some um, years living in Italy and with W.H. Right. Auden. And, and when he met John and, and Frank, they were pretty much right out of college. So in his first references to them that uh, I found, he's talking of them almost like it, it kind of, as though they were, as though they were just that, you know, young, young people. Boys, yeah. he, was, he was all of five years older, but. Right. I think he might've called them the Harvard wits at one point. That was what other people did call call them yes yes and he being the only one including porter who did not attend harvard that's right yeah that's right yeah well uh, i don't know about barbara guest either but of the four male yeah members, the four males the only one who attended, did not attend harvard in fact he didn't even graduate from college it was uh, almost uh, uh well it was all male at that point certainly uh, there's a famous story about alex katz saying uh uh, I, you know, when uh, Schuyler said he, he didn't go to Harvard and uh, Katz said, no, you sounded much more like that. And Schuyler said, no, actually it was much more West Virginia panhandle than uh, right. Cambridge, Mass. Where did he go to college? He went to some, a, a small religious college in West Virginia. He got a scholarship to called Bethany right. College. And uh, I don't know why he went there other than the fact that he did get a 
um, uh, scholarship and he was a terrible student. He, he did not do well in college, flunked out essentially, although he did have one good teacher, one English teacher who he uh, uh, learned from, but, um, but it, he flunked out and, and then the war came along and he had to go into the, he joined the Navy to avoid being drafted and he um, made one cross Atlantic uh, convoy in the battleship that he was. Oh, really? And when he came back, he, he jumped ship. Uh, he had a, one of his, a, a kind of a mental breakdown, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I guess. Although it also might've been just that he got drunk and missed the sailing of the ship. But he um, was AWOL for 29 days. And if you, he, he must have known that if you were AWOL for 30 days, you become a deserter. And at 29 days, you're just a straggler. So he was um, punished by, you know, he, he, he was during the, the uh, hearings about this, he, he, he claimed he revealed his homosexuality, hoping that it would kind of get him a retroactive 4F. Right. which didn't work, but it just made that meant that he was kicked out of the Navy as, as an undesirable um, uh -huh. recruit, which was good in a way because that ship that he was on was sunk at, uh, during the Normandy invasion. Oh my with, word. With quite a bit of loss of life. So we, we might not have ever had a James Schuyler if he- Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. That's gonna, this autobiography is gonna be extraordinary. Biography, so geez. He, I mean, <laughs> sorry, that uh, um, it's going to be extraordinary to know more about this life. So if we fast forward a bit and he's in New York and maybe hanging out or going to the Seaboard and Nash Gallery, whom, and he meets, obviously, the group there, which includes... He met them virtually first, in a sense, in that um, he, he, was, he had his first uh, published works in, his small, in a magazine called Accent, and he got his copy and he was pouring over it and looking at it. And, and the, the next page was a poem by someone named Frank O'Hara, who he'd never heard of. And um, uh, this story has been told a lot, but, but it's still pretty, pretty good. Um, he, yeah. he, 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 did, he did already know John Bernard Myers from Buffalo because he grew up in the suburbs of Buffalo. This is the director of the T. Bordenage Gallery. Right. And so John Bernard Myers called him up to say, oh my goodness, I've just got an accent. You're, you're, this is wonderful. You're a poet. I had no idea. Yeah. And Jimmy, to, to modestly to change the subject, said, well, I just, I, I love the poet uh, poems, the poem in this collection by <clears throat> somebody named Frank O'Hara. And John <laughs> Bernard Meyer said, well, my goodness, he's sitting right here with me in the gallery. So they, they first met through the pages of accent, and then finally they did meet later on at a Larry Rivers opening. Right, right, so there you are. They all come together. Of course, they, as I said, from, from Harvard, Kenneth Koch had graduated in 49. Uh, O'Hara came after the service back there and Ashbery was a senior. And of course, O'Hara and Ashbery met working on a literary uh, uh, magazine. And um, Koch was already, Kenneth Koch was already in graduate school in, in New York, I believe at Columbia, but he famously said, you can use my apartment. He'd gone home for the summer and left a key with his downstairs neighbor who was none other than Jane Freiliker. <laughs> so that started that uh, uh, relationship, you might say, and as she was the extraordinary muse to uh, this entire circle. And I think Kenneth wrote maybe to Ashbery and said, having met uh, Schuyler, I think he's a contender. He certainly uh, was already crazy about Jane Freilicher. <laughs> so, right, that's right. Yeah, so this, this might little, be, what, go ahead. Kenneth was a little dubious about Jimmy at first and it yeah. took a little, yeah. um, a little getting to know him before he realized how great he was. Right, right. And so uh, let's let's uh, catch up with this this band of uh, not merry pranksters, but uh, the three the the three poets and Jane Freilicher on a weekend in the Hamptons in '53. You want to get, and we'll have a little introduction by way of introducing a short some 
clips from a film that was made. Would you introduce that for us? Oh, yes. Well, um, in 1952, the poets all started to write plays. And Jimmy wrote a play, had just met uh, Jane, and, and wrote a, a play called Presenting Jane Freilicher, which she asked be changed to Presenting Jane. She was getting ready to, to uh, have her first solo show. Right. And, uh, so Jimmy wrote this very crazy, surreal, nonsense play. Very non sequitur, no, no plot, no 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 drama. And uh, somehow um, the lyricist John uh, Latouche read it, who was sort of a, on the fringes of their, their group and, and wanted to make a movie of it. Jimmy couldn't believe that anyone would want to make a movie of this nonsense play he'd written. Uh -huh. But nonetheless, it went on. It, it, so it happened. And uh, John Latouche found a filmmaker to shoot it. And he um, uh, they rented a house out in, out in um, what in Georgia Capond, mm -hmm. and uh, lo and behold, they all gathered together to make to make the movie over a couple of uh, weeks. Um, uh, the, the film and the play were both lost for a while, um, but I found the the play in the New York Public Library, what was hiding in plain sight, and, wow. and Karen, Karen Rothman um, uh, uh, dug out the footage of the the um, the film. Right. In an extraordinary feat of uh, research. Sleuthing. <laughs> Sleuthing, yes, exactly. <laughs> amazing, yeah, just amazing. It was never finished. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, everyone apparently, Jane described the, the shooting as, as chaotic, like a, walk, like a Marx Brothers movie. <laughs> and everyone was fighting with one another. And John Bernard Myers got in on the act and he was out there with Herbert Meaches and mm. Larry Rivers was nearby and they were all kind of, <laughs> Oh goodness! Um, <laughs> there goes my light, my key light. Go ahead, please. <laughs> well, anyway, that's it. So the 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 action on the on the screen has no relation to Jimmy's text, particularly. Right. But it probably was intended that the text would be read um, during the you know as an mm -hmm. as a voiceover. Okay, so um, this will shame all of us who just spend a quiet weekend in the Hamptons and don't make a film, right? <laughs> Um, let's look at the clips, uh, and we, uh, Nathan or I may interject if we want to point out who's uh, entering the scene so everyone will know who the, who the actors are, the poet, painter, slash actors. All right, thank you. Thank you, Victor. Cue up the film. So Jimmy wasn't in the script of the play, but he, the John Latouche cast him as a kind of invisible, uh, uh, unacknowledged observer of the scene. Yeah. That was he just peeking up. Right, peeking out. This is John Latouche's convertible, which they uh, <laughs> drive <laughs> to get out there. Young John Ashbery. Jane. You see, they don't really acknowledge Jimmy. He's invisible to them, apparently. <laughs> and he, he's sort yeah. of like a Cocteau character. Indeed. They had, they had, they put a plank under the water there for Joan, Jane to walk, walk along. Again, that's Georgia Capon, yeah. Here she comes. Here she comes.
his facial expressions are <laughs> extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. The, the text still hasn't been published and, and should and will be one day. Great. Um, I think we can queue up the, um, the slides now, Nathan. All right. Not Nathan. <laughs> Victor, am I asking you? Victor can do that for us. Thank you so much, Victor. This is um, from the summer of 1955, which I believe was the first time or one of the first times he went up to Maine. The first time he went there, August of 1955, and he stayed there about four weeks. Um, Jimmy uh, Fairfield painted this very, very beautiful, meltingly tender portrait of him. Yeah. This is, I think in later years, Jimmy would always call it uh, the skinny Jimmy portrait <laughs> as he yeah. aged and put out a few pounds, but yes. Very young, this was the screen porch um, on the house in Maine where so many times uh, Porter painted pictures. Um, Jimmy in fact wrote a letter and I guess we'll both be calling him Jimmy for shorthand, wrote a letter to Kenneth Koch and said that he, um, Porter had painted a lot that summer, painted a portrait of himself. I'm sorry, I can't. And that, um, in fact, Frank O'Hara was coming up to replace him very soon that the next week, Jimmy would go back to New York and Frank. So there was kind of this um, continual um, visitation from, from New York painters and poets really to the house in Maine. This is a, a house that uh, Fairfield had really come to since uh, childhood. His father, he was born and raised in Winnetka outside of Chicago and, um, he, his father purchased this island, Great Spruce Head in Penobscot Bay as uh, when Fairfield was small and he grew up there coming in the summer as his father built the house. And it was very, very important to him and his siblings as well to spend those summers there. Let's see, the next slide. Um, this commences maybe sharing some of the poetry Nathan, this is, I, um, yes, <laughs> this is a, um, a poem that so interested me because I think it begins the, the diaries that you um, brought together. This is one of the first entries for the That's year. That's right. That's Nine right. Em Empathy and New Year mm -hmm. was the, um, what is the poem that we're going to hear James Schuyler reading. Mm -hmm. uh, and the the um, it it's he wrote it the on New Year's Eve and it, on New Year's Day, 1967, 68, um, as we learned from the from the diary, where he had, makes some of the same remarks about particularly about Darwin's autobiography. Mm -hmm. um, it has domestic sort of details of he was, but at this point, Jimmy was living in the Porter's house as he did wow. for um, uh, 11 or 12 years. Uh, as Ann Porter famously said, he came for the weekend and stayed 11 years. Wow. Um, and it was a very productive time for Jimmy, most of it, um, a very happy time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the poem includes some, some domestic, details and he wrote this is in fact a, a view from the house to the stable uh behind the the house porter's house on south main street uh they had purchased that in 1949 porter always said um he wanted to be able to be near the ocean if it ever happened came to pass that he couldn't afford to go to great spruce head in the summer so he selected southampton bought this old captain's house on South Main in 1949 and moved the whole family, which was then um, four children um, out there. And that's where they grew up and where he lived the entire uh, rest of his life. This is a view from the house uh, to the stable, as I said, in the back and that, that white, uh, the, the upper right 
um, it, are the hayloft doors, which in fact is where he had a studio. He put a window in the hayloft and it, he had this sort of uh, bird's eye view of the surrounding houses. So this is really looking back towards the studio. Okay, shall we queue up? Let's, let's listen to the poem while we walk, look at the uh, image, the yeah. snow scenes. Empathy and New Year. A notion like that of empathy inspires great distrust in us because it connotes a further dose of irrationalism and mysticism. Levi Strauss. <laughs> One, Whitman took the cars all the way from Camden and when he got here, or rather there, said, quit quoting, and took the next back through the Jersey meadows, which were that then. But what if it is all my uh, illusion? I doubt it, though. Men are not so inventive, or few are. Not knowing a name for something proves nothing. Right now it isn't raining, snowing, sleeting, slushing. Yet it is doing something. As a matter of fact, it is raining snow. Snow from cold clouds that melts as it strikes. To look out a window is to sense wet feet. Now to infuse the garage with a subjective state and can't make it seem to, even if it is a little like what the dentist saw, a dark gullet with gleams and red. You come to me at midnight and say, I can smell that after Christmas letdown coming like a hound. <laughs> and clarify, I can smell it just like a hound does. So it came. It's a shame expectations are so often to be counted on. New Year is nearly here, and who, knowing himself, would endanger his desires, resolving them in a formula? After a while, even a wish flashing by as a thought provokes a knock on wood so often, a little dish-like place worn in this desk just holds a lucky stone inherited from an, an unlucky man. 1968, what a lovely name to give a year. <laughs> Even better than the dogs. <laughs> Wirt, bird thou never, and woofy. Personally, I'm going to call the new year mutt. <laughs> Flattering it will get you nowhere. <laughs> Two, awake at four and heard a snow plow not rumble a huge beast at its chow, and wondered, is it 1968 or 1969 for a bit? 1968 had such a familiar sound. Got coffee and started reading Darwin. So modest, so innocent, so pleased at the surprise that he should grow up to be him. <laughs> <coughs> How grand to begin a new year with a new writer you really love. A snow shovel scrapes, it's 12 hours later, and the sun that came so late is almost gone. A few pink minutes, and yet the days get longer. Coming from the movies last night, snow had fallen in almost still air and lay on all, so all twigs were emboldened to make big disclosures. It felt warm, warm that is for cold, the way it does when snow falls without wind. A snow picture, you said, under the clung to elms, worth painting. I said, the weather operator said, turning tomorrow to bitter cold. Then the wind will veer round to the north and blow it, all of it down. Maybe, I thought, it will get cold some other way. You, as usual, were right. It did and has, night and snow and the threads of life for once seen as they are in ropes like roots. Thank you. That was from a reading given at the Dia Foundation in 1988, his first right. book reading. It's, um, 
it's good to hear that audience reaction. Maybe when you hear poetry read, you think you're not supposed to laugh, right? But uh, uh, there's always that humor that, that uh, it's sometimes self-deprecating, but uh, very funny. I mean, when you read his letters, he uh, can be extraordinarily funny, also sort of uh, very witty and very piercing in a way. Um, I think these, knowing that his bedroom sort of looked out on this view uh, in the porter's backyard. And of course, when he says we walked for, for the movies, that's the movies in Southampton, uh, just up the corner, uh, just up the street from the house. I was amused about thinking, remember, we used to have to call up the weather lady to hear the weather. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't on 24 hours a day. Uh, next slide. So here, uh, here are two photographs of uh, John Ashbery and, and Jimmy on Great Spruce Ted. Uh, one in 1966 mm -hmm. and one, they say, in 1969, I guess so. Um, I think the, the one on the left was found in Jimmy's camera. So I think uh, it was probably taken by Fairfield, although I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Um, the rest of the, of the role was photographs by Jimmy. Mm -hmm. um, their friendship was terribly important to, to both of them. Uh, they sort of, Jimmy felt that John was his really closest friend for many, much, much of his life, I think. Mm -hmm. It's and interesting that um, that tabletop looks like one that uh, Porter would have said, don't clear that, I'll paint it. You know, that sort of right. order yeah. of chaos, which is what he liked to uh, present in a way. Uh, next slide, Victor. Uh, this is a wonderful painting on that self same porch. Um, the same year also, um, right. 1966. Um, I read uh, something about po um, Schuyler, Ashbery, and uh, Porter, uh, uh, and O'Hara certainly wrote for Art News. They wrote art criticism. Um, very interesting, I think, uh, something Schuyler once wrote. He said, what we are given in Porter's work is an aspect of everyday life, seen neither as a snapshot nor as an exaltation. It's art is one that values the everyday as the ultimate, the most varied and desirable knowledge. What these paintings celebrate is never treated as an archetype. They are con concentrated instances. They are not a substitute for religion. They are an attitude towards life. I think that's so good. So yeah. right on the mark. He was a terrific art critic as well and writer. They both were, but yes. Yeah, they both were, but uh, interesting in that um, uh, friendship. I mean, just look at this. Is that a newspaper there on the floor? This is, of course, Skylar. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's the iced coffee. There's the iced coffee. Uh, that's their older daughter, uh, Katie. And uh, it's rather extraordinary uh, vase of flowers there on the floor, just just there, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, beautiful, thank you. Victor, we'll look at the next one. From 69, you can see um, Porter, Ashbery, Schuyler, and Jane Freilicher on Great Spruce Head. I believe Jane's husband, Joe Hazen, took this picture originally. Um, Jane didn't go there too many times, I don't believe, but uh, this was a summer when everyone came to visit. It was a big house. It's also called the main house there and uh, very accommodating and copious. Um, I can only wonder who cooked all the meals. I think it was Ann Porter. <laughs> yes, it was on a wood, wood burning stove. <laughs> a wood burning stove. And the groceries had to be fetched from the mainland by the brother's boat, which was yes. Gone. So they would stock up for the week. Creaky, yes, yes, indeed. It was only accessible also by the ferry uh, uh, when you arrived. Uh, so uh, beloved, certainly, and I think I think certainly beloved by, by by Jimmy as much as Porter. It was so influential in his in his writings. It was it was next. 
Here's Frank O'Hara painted by uh, Porter, uh, of course. Uh, Frank and Jimmy were roommates for se several years. They moved in uh, to, the, Jimmy moved into Frank's apartment, or I guess Frank took that apartment in 1952 after the uh, summer that they spent, that during which they filmed Presenting Jane. Mm -hmm. And uh, they lived together there till on and off uh, till 1957 when Frank and, and uh, his friend Joe Lesur moved out. Um, if, the, I, I'm reminded looking at this, this is the uh, couch uh, up in the studio, in the stable studio up in the Hayloft studio that uh, Porter had uh, this extraordinary, uh, he must have loved painting this floral pattern because he never, you know, I always thought, well, maybe he could have thrown a sheet over it at uh -huh. this time and a half. But I'm reminded of what Barbara Guest said about, um, you know, about Schuyler actually being, and something that's often said about Porter, he was an intimist, sort yeah. of referring to the poetry of, uh, the paintings rather of, um, of Vuillard and Bonar and the wonderful French artists at the turn of the century whom, whom Porter did so admire, but painting these interiors and curtains and, and light and uh, just, uh, just sort of the intimacy of this, this scene, which often uh, you see this in Vuillard as well as his family. And certainly uh, with Porter, these, these poets, friends of his were, were very close, were, were very close to him like family and spent a great deal of time together. Jimmy actually said at one point, I, wanted, I tried to write poems that were like Fairfield's paintings. Um, yeah. I kind of sometimes wish he hadn't said that because <laughs> It, it seems to limit how we think of the poems, but, but, um, but he did also say that he, he thought his poems, poems were as concerned with looking at things and trying to transcribe them as painting is. And I, I've always thought it was very important that he used the word transcribe rather than describe. Yes. Because transcribing is more of a passive act where you're, you're letting sensations come in, in and through you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in real time, as it were, and um, I think that's something he 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 saw in in Porter's work also a, a sense of being in the moment, right. and describing the moment in his case into colored goo, and into Jimmy's in, in Jimmy's case into into words. Very well said. Yeah, beautiful. I think the next slide, Victor. Uh, this will introduce our next poem. That's right, which I'm going to read because um, Jimmy never did read this aloud that I know of. It mm -hmm. might have been too hard for him because it is was uh, written in memory of, of Frank O'Hara, one of many poems he wrote about Frank O'Hara after his death in 1966. Mm -hmm. but this was the first one and it's called Buried at Springs. He wrote it, uh, I'm not sure exactly when right now, I think a year or two later, but possibly that same summer, 1966. Mm -hmm. It's in two parts and the, originally they were two separate poems, but he showed them to John Ashbery and John had the suggestion of putting them together as one poem. Um, and so he did. <clears throat> Buried at Springs. There is a hornet in the room and one of us will have to go out the window into the late August mid-afternoon sun. I won. There is a certain challenge in being humane to hornets, but not much. A launch draws two lines of wake behind it on the bay like a delta with a melted base. Sandy billows, or so they look, of feathery ripe heads of grass an acid yellow kind of goldenrod, glowing or glowering in shade. Rocks with rags of shadow, washed dust clouts that will never bleach. It is not like this at all. The rapid running of the lapping water 
a hollow knock of someone shipping oars. It's 11 years since Frank sat at this desk and saw and heard it all. The incessant water, the immutable crickets, only not the same. New needles on the spruce, new seaweed on the low tide rocks, other grass and other water, even the great gold lichen on a granite boulder, even the boulder quite literally is not the same. Two, a day subtle and suppressed in mounds of juniper and folding scratchy pockets of shadow while bigness, rocks, trees, a stump, stands shadowless in an overcast of ripe grass. There is nothing but shade like the boggy depths of a stand of spruce, its resonance just the thin scream of mosquitoes ascending. Boats are light lumps on the bay, stretching past erased islands to ocean and the terrible tumble and London, rain persisting and Paris changing to rain. Delicate day setting the bright of a young spruce against the cold of an old one hung with unripe cones, each exuding at its tip gum, pungent, clear as a tear, a day tarnished and fractured as the quartz in the rocks of a dulled and distant point. A day like a gull passing with a slow flapping of wings in a kind of lope, without breeze enough to shake loose the last of the fireweed flowers. A faintly clammy day like wet silk stained by one dead branch, the harsh russet of dried blood. Mm. It's, it's astonishing and, you know, particularly to see it with the, the foreground and detail of, of, of Porter, you know, in the painting. Needles on the spruce, I, I've always loved that. Yeah, yeah. The wake of the ferry. Yeah. Jimmy also said of Porter that to, he thought Maine what for Porter was a state of mind, an identification, and it became so for Jimmy too, I think. I think so. I think so. He would have accompanied them there whenever he could for as long as he could, I think. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Victor, thank you. Uh, how about the next slide? There's two images of uh, Porter working, two photographs. That's in the Southampton studio. As I said, this is a, a hayloft, so it's a second story. And he uh, put in the uh, large windows, sometimes with, of course, it has the mullions. Sometimes he painted those. Sometimes he painted, a, you know, just a sheet of glass. Um, and this is where uh, sort of he painted exclusively in Southampton. And on the right, of course, he is out uh, in nature. He had a little red wagon, I think, that he took his painting materials with and uh, went all over the island, getting various views from uh, out, out to the mainland uh, or across to the other islands, rather. It was, uh, as you say, Nathan very much in his uh, uh, DNA in that sense. Um, someone once said, well, you go to Maine because the light, he goes, no, because I go to Maine because it's in my, and it's in my bones. Mm -hmm. That has been my en entire life. Siblings, grown siblings, notwithstanding. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> he had uh, one sister and, th and three brothers. In fact, his brother, Elliot Porter, the very well-known photographer, there's a whole series of uh, Elliot Porter's work that's really looking down at these um, uh, ground covers, you might, you might say, in which Porter also would often paint just sort of the vegetation at his feet, the growth, the, the growth that was uh, sort of on the sides of the, of the rocky uh, hillsides. Beautiful. Uh, next. Um, of course, Porter was, you know, almost a generation older uh, than these younger artists, uh, but he was very much, I think, accepted 
you know, buy them as a, certainly as a peer, but also uh, there was a funny quote that at a party of Nell Blaine's, um, I think someone says to John Ashbery that they saw Furl, which was sort of a nickname for Fairfield. It's what Anne called him and others sort of picked that up. And, um, and that one said to, to another, I saw Fairfield the other day and God, he looks five years younger every time I see him. <laughs> How does he do it? Uh, but he um, sort of maintained that, uh, uh, I wouldn't say an avuncular, you know, relationship, but he was uh, really very much uh, a part of that, that group. Uh, this is a beautiful self-portrait from uh, right in the studio. Yes, yes. Uh, next slide. Ah, uh, here they are. Jimmy and John again, um, and in the, the one on the right, um, <clears throat> it was painted <laughs> apparently during during the time they were they were actually writing their collaborative novel, A Nest of Ninnies, which they began in the car uh, when they were driving back from uh, the one of the filmings of Presenting Jane in 1952, um, and so they 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 passed around they passed back and forth they. Uh, legal pad, as you see Jimmy there, uh, starting with every other sentence, they would uh, pass it back and forth. And then it got to be slightly longer um, sections. Uh, when, when John moved to, to France in 1955, they discontinued it. They, they tried to do it at long distance, but it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So then they started up again when he moved back in, in about 63, I think and finally finished it um, in, and published it in 1969. So that was a 17-year gestation of this brilliant, um, very funny novel like no other novel. <laughs> um, I, I've never really understood what it was kind of about. It wasn't it about <laughs> anything per se. <laughs> it's not about anything. It, it, okay. they, but both of them grew up in, in uh, Upstate New York, in um, right, okay, and uh, you know, there's something there's something about uh, East Aurora, in which the, the the action takes place in in the suburbs near a large city. So there's something about there's some maybe some aspect of East Aurora, New York, where Jimmy grew up. Yeah, in in the feeling of it, and also something of Southampton, of course, where 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 uh, they both spent quite a bit of time. Yeah. Interesting. And there's that couch. <laughs> that couch again. Okay, next, Victor. Oh, this is um, for uh, several volumes of, of Schuyler's poetry. Uh, Fairfield did the covers. This is the beautiful one for the uh, collection called Hymn to Life. It's the title of the poem as well, but you can see this beautiful watercolor, which um, I think reflects beautifully um, it's almost like their relationship in the, in, in the sense of the detail and the color and the, the transcription or, uh, of the work. Tell us about uh, Him to Life, Nathan. Jimmy had several um, serious mental breakdowns and hospitalizations. Um, one, a, a very bad one in 1971, uh, which entailed some very, uh, a lot of... Um, uh, Ill drama, let's say, and a hospitalization in, in Vermont. Um, and he, he came back um, to Southampton in um, the fall of 71, I guess. Mm -hmm. This poem was, it, it, it seems in a way that his, his breakdowns, um, terrible as they were, but they, to him, he, he always felt that they were cathartic in a sense. So this poem was written the year after, the spring after that, summer and uh, summer breakdown of 71 in, in the spring of 1972. Mm -hmm. when he was back back at, at uh, 49 South Main Street. <clears throat> um, and it's an extraordinary performance, I, I think. Um, very uh, rich, beautiful poem full of, full of imagery, uh, full of visual, you know, he said he was a visual poet and there's, there's just, it just abounds with color and um, 
Beautiful. Beautiful, surprising imagery, I think. Uh, I, I thought we, we could hear the, the first 20 or so lines and the last 20, 20 or so lines okay. of this, this quite long poem. It, it's about, I don't know what, a, a fifth of it or something like that. Right, right, all right. So uh, we'll listen to that and this, this will um, conclude this portion mm -hmm. of our talk. We do have several questions in a chat, so I'd be glad to respond. If you have questions, just go to the uh, bottom um, line on, on your screen and you can send us a comment or a question. I'm also gonna add that this reading was in 1986. Okay. Uh, before the, the public reading at the DIA and you can hear his voice is a little muffled he, he was, um, uh, uh, had a sort of a soft mouth because of um, uh, the, partly it, due to the medications he had been taking. Um, um, so it's, it's a little muffled, uh, his voice, but after a while you, you'll, you'll get, get used to that. Okay, great. Okay, if we get Human that. life. The wind rests its cheek upon the ground and feels the cool damp and lifts its head with twigs and small dead blades of grass pressed into it as you might at the beach rise up and brush away the sand. The day is cool and says, I'm just staying overnight. The world is filled with music and in between the music silence and varying the silence all sorts of sounds natural and man-made. There goes a plane, some cars, geese that honk, and not here, but not far away, a scream so rending that to hear it is to be never again the same. Why, this is hell. Out of the death-breeding soil here rise emblems of innocent snowdrops that struggle easily into life and hang their white enamel heads toward the dirt and in the yellow grass are small wild crocuses from hills goats have cropped to barrenness. The corms come by mail, are planted, then do their thing, to live, to live. So natural and so hard, hard as it seems, it must be for green spears to pierce the all but frozen mold and insist that they too, like mouse-eared chickweed, will live. The spears lengthen, the bud appears and spreads, its seed capsule fattens and falls, the green turns yellowish and withers, stretched upon the ground. Now, ten pages later. May leans in my window offering hornets. To them too I give leave to go about their business which is not nesting in my books. The fresh mown lawn is a rug underneath which is swept the dirt, the living dirt out of which our nurture comes, to which we go, not knowing if we hasten or we tarry. May opens wide her bluest eyes and speaks in bird tongues and a chainsaw. The blighted elms come down. Already maple saplings where other elms once grew and whelmed, count as young trees. In a dishpan, the soap powder dissolves under a turned-on faucet and makes foam, just like the waves that crash ashore at the foot of the street. A restless surface, chewing and spitting sand and small white pebbles, clamshells with a sheen or chalky white, a horseshoe crab, primeval. And all this without thought, this churning energy, energy. The sun sucks up the dew, the day is clear, a bird shits on my window ledge, rain will wash it off, or a storm will chip it loose. Life I do not understand. The days tick by, each so unique, each so alike. What is that chatter in the grass? May is not a flowering month so much as shades of green, yellow-green, blue-green, or emerald, or dusted like the lilac leaves. The lilac trusses stand in bud. A cardinal passes like a flying tulip, a light and nails the green day down. One flame in a fire of sea-soaked 
copper-fed wood, a red that leaps from green and holds it there. Reluctantly, the plane tree, always late, as though from age, opens up and hangs its seed balls out. The apples flower. The pear is past. Winter is suddenly so far away. Behind, ahead. From the train, a stand of coarse grass and fuzzy flower. Is it for miracles we live? I like it when the morning sun lights up my room like a yellow jelly bean, an inner glow. May mutters, why ask questions? Or, what are the questions you wish to ask? It's absolutely astounding. I love that flying tulip. Flying tulip. I love the snowdrops uh, hanging there, enamel heads. Uh, it just has such an extraordinary in a way to evoke <laughs> nature. And interesting, he speaks about the, the ocean at the end of the street. I think uh, Ann Porter has a, a poem called The Sea at the End of the Street. And he was, um, by all accounts, enormously um, supportive of Anne uh, yeah. in her work as a, as a poet. Um, and um, it would <laughs> it would make sense when they you know spent a great deal of time together. But he was very positive about what she was doing, and she she is an extraordinary writer as well. She is. So <laughs> um, let's see what's in the Q and A, shall we? Yeah. All right. Uh, did you know or meet him, Nathan? Yes, I did know him. I uh, uh, met him through mutual friends uh, in the '80s, late '80s, and we were we were quite quite close um, in the last year of his life. Excellent. I saw him a lot, and um, um, when he died, I, I approached his uh, executor, Dara Park, about for some reason. I had the nerve to ask if I could write the biography and Dara said, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not ready to decide who will do that yet, but why huh? don't you edit the, why don't you edit the, the uh, he very generously uh, <clears throat> proposed that I edit the diary, which I did. And when I did that at the same time, I did conduct some interviews with people. So um, thinking that perhaps one day I would in fact write the diary. Right, right. And, uh, but what I did with those, interviews at that time was to compile a chronology of his life that, that accompanied, that appeared at the end of the, of the diary. Great. Uh, we have a question from Eric or comment from Eric Brown. I would be interested to know more about Fairfield and Jimmy's relationship first to honor it by acknowledging that they were romantically involved and longtime companions. Presumably it was one of the most consequential relationships of their respective lives and seemed to accept it. What do you think they were like together? Any sense of the dynamic between them? <laughs> uh, I've been thinking about this relationship for over 20 years and right. I, I, don't, I still don't know all about it, of course. Uh, I think it was um, very important for both of them, very close. Uh, at one point, Jimmy with the, I think what he, what he would have called the reticence of intimacy in, yeah. in, in um, uh, Empathy and New Year said that Fairfield was his best friend, um, which was a, obviously an understatement, but um, a precise one, I think. Um, uh, uh, Anne also said something, I think, very uh, generous, which was that it never occurred to her to ask how physical the relationship was. Yeah. Okay. Um, and if it didn't occur to her, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I feel that as well. Well, there, you know, also can be denial in one person's life, but I think, uh, and because she was so open and talked about it reliably in the very excellent, um, biography that Justin Spring wrote, wrote of Porter, uh, it seemed to be, 
you know, well acknowledged by the whole circle. Another question is, is can you comment on the intimate sexual relationships between Skylar Fairfield O'Hare and Ashbury? Well, I think you'll find, yeah. She was, she was open about it talking to, to Justin, but it was not at all open during, the, during Fairfield's life. It, it, oh, the no. family did not talk about it at all. No. Um, but. And, it's, and it, it's, um, it was very, very private, all that. Time. Yes. We only spoke about it after uh, really both of them had died. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Ashbury and Porter's relationship is detailed in Karen Rothman's, you know, first volume of that. Um, so, I, you know, I always think these are facts that, that they're about uh, sex, the sexual side of relationships between people. But if you think back over, like, any relationships, heterosexual or any kind over a period of time, there's sex and then there's everything else. I mean, that's just me, <laughs> that's just my comment. So I, I never think it's determinate. Uh, yes, there's no question there was that element, whether how long that continued. And, and there's a you know curious intimacy that this goes far beyond sexual really. I think in all these, they were extremely close in those ways. So I would just uh, leave it to that, no? Was letter poem number three written for anyone in particular? Yes, uh, um, uh, Bob Jordan, uh, his lover in the um, early 70s, who was a married man, lived in New Jersey. Um, and um, uh, I've not been able to track, tra tra he's probably dead by now, but I had, I'd tried tracking him down um, much uh, years ago when I was compiling the chronology, but I could not, um, could not trace him. Um, mm -hmm. Karen Rothman probably would have been able to, but I wasn't. Stop. <laughs> don't get a compliment. <laughs> um, that's the that's a poem. I don't know that title, but obviously a poem written to someone in particular. Yes, yeah. it was, it was uh, written. Three. That's from Mark Milroy, someone who knows the work well. Um, I think we have a comment from um, or a chat, something in the chats here. No, Can I not I'm read? letting you do these. Uh, no, I know I don't seem to be. Uh, they sort of disappeared. No, um, any more questions, Declan? I, somebody's asking, did Skyler continue to give readings in his life? And yes, he did. After the 1988 one, he. He kind of got into it and he gave, a ma I've, I don't remember exactly, but five or six or more readings in New York and one in San Francisco at the San Francisco Art Institute, which Bill Berkson organized and one in, at, the, in Guild, at the Guild Hall in uh, East Hampton, which he, he said he agreed to uh, because he hoped that Anne would come and hear him, which, and I told Anne this and she said, well, I'm so glad I did then. Oh, good. <laughs> um, Jay Hunt, um, yes, it's asked about a show of artist poems, poets working together, which yes, we have often done that, uh, talking about the, the circles of the artists and poets. Uh, Helen Searing has asked about Nest of Nennies. Was it in the nature of a verbal exquisite corpse in the sense that it was passed back? Guess, yeah, you could say that, except that nothing was hidden. They 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 saw what they were they each saw everything that the other was was writing so they continued on, uh, but they didn't know where they were going. Somebody's asked if uh, Skyler's work has been set to music. The answer is yes. Uh, Ned Roram set several songs to music. Um, Gerald Busby set several songs to music, and um, Jimmy wrote a cantata. Uh, was con was commissioned to write. The Picnic Cantata, uh, which was set by um, Paul Bowles, who was also, of course, a composer as well as a novelist. Um, I, I think I misinterpreted Jay Hunt's question. He was talking about specifically uh, what you and the painter Joan Mitchell did as far as poems and her interpretation. Could you comment on that for us briefly? Well, she. <laughs> I met Joe when I was I was working at the Robert Miller Gallery for many years, mm -hmm. and we we showed Joan Mitchell, and I um, 
told her I was, um, you know, a great friend of Jan James Schuyler, and uh, she got out of me uh, what was not really known by many people that I, I did write poetry, and so she was very encouraging about that, and and um, kind of um, uh, kept asking me to send her poetry, and and at some point it just it just happened. It wasn't I wasn't really warned that she she decided she would use some in a um, and she she needed a project. She right. was working with Ken Tyler, the print the printmaker, and she needed something to occupy her her days there um, between proofings. So she decided to do a, a livre d'artiste, an artist book. And um, uh, to my alarm, she asked that I provide the poems. <laughs> <laughs> it was a tremendous honor. Um, so we did that together. Yes, I want you to know that uh, Nathan said, absolutely, I was not to mention his own <laughs> in relationship to this uh, book. Uh, you seem to be on another, oh, oh, I see where you are with the, yeah, questions. In the 1952 film was the boathouse that used to stand on Meadow Lane. No, this was in fact on Georgica, the, it was Georgia oh. Pond. That's, I don't know where it was, yeah. but it was on Georgia Pond. That, that was the side of that. Um, all right, everyone wants to know when we can order the biography here. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna finish the current draft in um, a couple of months. And then, then of course it does take uh, rewriting. So. It's an enormous undertaking, but well, your, your fans are eagerly awaiting. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you from Frank Bruno. You're enjoying this very much. Since John Latouche came up, can you say anything about how close Kenward Elmsley, a poet I admire, but who often slips between the cracks, uh, was to Schuyler and the Porter's Circle? Thanks. He was very close to Schuyler, not so much to the Porter's. Um, okay. he, he met Jimmy in 61, I think, um, but they became uh, much closer friends in, after 64 when um, Elmsley and Brainerd met and became lovers and long-term mm -hmm. partners. And uh, Jimmy went quite often up to um, to Callis, Vermont, to their house there, their farmhouse, and stayed there for long periods and wrote some wonderful poems, uh, which you can identify because they usually in the book, they usually it says Vermont uh, uh, for those poems. And mm -hmm. um, uh, Kenward, would probably not like me to say this, but at one point he did give a, um, um, he set up a trust fund for Jimmy, who, the income mm -hmm. of which helped him during his life and the principal reverted back to him on his death, back to Kenward. Well, as, as soon as he did that, their relationship kind of fell apart, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. not, not as soon as that, but, but a little bit, the, the, when money entered into it, the relationship became a little, Difficult, um, not not least also because Jimmy was uh, getting a little manic at that time in the in the seventies. Uh, someone has asked about a diagnosis of of Schuyler's. Well, I don't, have not had access to the to the medical records. Unfortunately, they were mm -hmm. they they, they I, I just didn't succeed in getting them. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. and I. It seems that they're not kept by hospitals. After a certain period, they're thrown mm -hmm. away, um, as far as I've been able to tell. But I did speak to his psychiatrist years and years and years ago, mm -hmm. who was also very cagey about everything. But what the, the sense I got was that he was basically bipolar. And um, mm -hmm. uh, he was depressive, and then he was manic, and then he was depressive, mm -hmm. and then he was manic. He was not schizophrenic, according to this uh, right. Dr. White. Right. right. Um, and someone has asked about the relationship between Fairfield and Elliot. I don't honestly know anything about that. I haven't heard. Uh, I don't know, but I know that Fairfield, I think Fairfield always felt like he was reverting to his childhood when he went to Maine because here he was with all of his siblings and the, sure. all those childhood relationships came back into force. The, the oldest sister was still bossy and sure, bossy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the other yeah. ones. Their way, roles. Yeah. Their roles. yeah, in a way, I think Elliot would have certainly had more success, if you want to say that, before certainly Porter did in the art world, just uh, since Porter got a rather late start.
I think Elliot was just a little bit older. So maybe in, in that sense, um, he, there was some rivalry, but uh, was Porter was a very know, known, well known photographer. I think they certainly respected each other's work. Absolutely. Uh, I hope we got everyone. It's a little after six, so I don't want to keep people too long. Uh, Nathan, wonderful, you see. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to come back. We just really, just really scraped right. the surface. Well, I wish I could see your, your show there um, okay. at the parish. It but looks, things, are, like, things are online and yeah, uh, looks beautiful. delineation and the poems that uh, are read, but the paintings. So it's a, it's a, it's a very deep and endless well. We're very fortunate to have had the gift of uh, the Porter paintings and to be able to um, delve into it in so many different ways over the years. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Nick. You're welcome. Thank now, you. Back to, back to work on that pile. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. I'd like to once again thank our presenting sponsor, Bank of America. Also, Sandy and Stephen Pearlbinder for their ongoing support and Art Bridges, which uh, after helping us reopen in August, uh, was instrumental in bringing public programs and online programs. Thank you all very much. Good night. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.